by way of modest introduction, I want to say that I am very pleased that the scenarios that the Center for Nanotechnology and Society at ASU has developed have found their way into the educational program here at University of Washington. And uh, as um, we heard in the earlier uh, talk in, in correspondence between uh, Deborah and myself and some members of our group uh, at ASU, because uh, the scenarios have, in fact, been one of our uh, greatest challenges with respect to the way that our work has been received in the scientific and engineering community uh, more broadly. And also, uh, and I think I can say this with our program officer in the room because he's our new program officer, uh, with respect to the way the National Science Foundation has also received some of our work. And what's at root in uh, using scenarios of future nanotechnolo nanotechnological developments is a conflict at times over um, concepts like possibility, plausibility, eventuality, um, between, as often is described, and, and Nigel hinted at something like this, between science fiction and science fact that often divides the approaches from, uh, that we see from the social sciences and humanities on one side to the sciences and engineering on the other side. So on, I'm exceptionally pleased that uh, what we've managed to do in taking our approach to thinking about plausible future uh, nanotechnological scenarios has contributed to science and engineering education for uh, graduate students in science and engineering. And what I want to do um, in the presentation, what you'll see in the, the paper that's on the website, is a deeper sort of historical exploration of this concept of plausibility and its role in the governance of science and engineering. And I start with um, the sort of interesting juxtaposition that's always troubled me. Um, the uh, photograph on the top is of the, uh, the chemist uh, and philosopher Michael Polanyi. Uh, below him is the chemist, and while we don't know him as a philosopher, he did end up doing a lot of work in, in the social sciences and economics, Frederick Soddy. And in his justly famous essay in 1961, The Republic of Science, Michael Polanyi relates an anecdote um, in which uh, he and Bertrand Russell were on a British radio show called The Brains Trust, uh, January 1945, and when asked a question uh, by a uh, radio, uh, by a, a call, a call in to the, the radio show about whether there was any possible technical uh, uh, consequence or uh, um, um, possible technical application of Einstein's theory of relativity, he and Russell were unable to come up with any such application in January of 1945. Of course, we know that uh, within months, there was a mushroom cloud over the plains of New Mexico, and then uh, less than months after that, over cities in Japan. Um, and Polanyi uses his and Russell's inability to forecast this technical use of, uh, of a scientific theory as uh, a rationale for, the, uh, for describing the essential unpredictability of scientific advance and therefore a rationale for the ungovernability of the entire science and engineering enterprise. Um, and he goes so far as to you know, say that he sort of makes a, a broad sweeping generalization that in, in essence because he and, and, uh, and Russell were unable to do this, it was obvious then that Albert Einstein, for example, could not have taken such consequences into mind when special relativity was formulated in 1905. Um, now, I want to juxtapose this with a story about Frederick Soddy, who remains on the bottom of your lower right of the screen. Uh, and on top of him there, uh, you see a picture of H.G. Wells. And for the science fiction fans among you, you will know that H.G. Wells in 1913 1914, sometimes it varies in the, in the literature, uh, published a novel called The World Set Free, which described the vision of biplanes dropping uh, atomic bombs, as he called them, on cities across the planet. And uh, The World Set Free was, in fact, dedicated to Saudi, who, as a chemist, did Nobel quality work with uh, Ernest Rutherford that uh, led to the description of transmutation. Uh, that won Rutherford his Nobel Prize, and later Saudi did additional Nobel quality work that led to his own Nobel Prize in 1921 in uh, describing the theory of, of uh, isotopes. Um, in between that work, 
Sadi was engaged in a great deal of uh, public activity, public lectures, writing for public audiences, and so forth, about the possibility of atomic energy. And initially, his work on atomic energy envisioned sort of uh, utopian applications of, of melting the poles and blooming the deserts and those sorts of things. And he had no idea how these things would be accomplished, but he understood the, uh, you know, the orders of magnitude uh, greater amounts of energy that were to be found within the atom than were to be found in chemical bonds. Um, and then as his thinking evolved, and there is a, a nice story that uh, political scientist and activist Richard Sclove tells in a 1989 paper about Saadi that was published in Science, Technology, and Human Values, that uh, Saadi's thinking evolved, and a lot of it involved his, uh, his personal background, his interests in alchemy that underpinned his interests in chemistry, that led, in fact, to him conceiving the concept of transmutation as essential to chemistry, uh, his uh, somewhat progressive political leanings, uh, the uh, associations around those, that led him to uh, begin a transformation in his thinking from this utopian vision of the application of atomic energy to thinking that uh, atomic weapons were, um, were something that would inevitably happen, and unlike the vision that Wells produces in the world set free, um, were something, in fact, uh, to be feared for their uh, power to annihilate rather than their uh, power to inspire peace. Um, what I want to focus on, though, is um, what it was, in some sense, that Saadi was doing, and this is now 1913, 1914, 1915. Um, is he doing something that, you know, that is foretelling, that is predicting? that is forecasting uh, the bomb, something from three decades out that uh, Polanyi was unable to do uh, from only a few months out, um, and what relationship that might have to the governance of science. Now, I don't want to you know, dismiss Polanyi entirely. First of all, he you know, was, in fact, quite uh, a brilliant and inspiring scientist and, and writer, um, and he deserves his due uh, not because... Um, you know, in essence, because the, the bomb was not uh, inevitable. That is, there's a sense in which um, even when you have, uh, as I'll describe later, all the technical pieces in place, it would still be uh, too deterministic a position to say that all the scientific knowledge made it inevitable that the bomb would be built, tested, deployed, and dropped on human populations. So I don't want to fault Polanyi for the wrong kinds of things here. I also don't want to credit Saudi in fact, for being right, um, because rather, um, you know, in some sense, that would violate some methodological uh, conceptions from the uh, social studies of science community to which I, I belong. But I really would rather credit him for things like taking serious questions seriously, grappling with the, quest the larger public questions of his day as they related to his research, engaging the public through lectures and writing, and envisioning these technical uses, even when, quote, at present we have no hint of how even to begin the quest. Um, and this last point here is one of the things that distinguishes Saadi's take on this stuff from Michael Polanyi's. That, uh, here's a, some fake Latin here, Eventura praediciamos said praedicio est impossibilis, that this is Polanyi's dilemma. He believes that in order to have the kinds of uh, understandings of consequences in the world we need to act, um, we must predict events, but of course, because science is unpredictable, prediction is impossible. So where does this kind of dilemma lead us? Um, and what happens after World War I and the experience that Saadi has in uh, having his research agenda at the University of Aberdeen bent toward the war effort and seeing his uh, friends and colleagues in uh, chemistry in Germany uh, have uh, their work turned toward the war effort as well uh, in much more consequential ways. Um, Saadi begins to drop his, uh, his physical chemistry agenda and starts turning to political and economic analyses. And um, he concludes uh, with the quote that you have there in the third bullet, it is our duty, therefore, to spend our lives and brains thinking this thing out for ourselves. And that's what he ends up doing. And over the course of uh, the interwar years and through the war, he continues on this agenda of thinking this stuff out in public, of engaging in these uh, political analyses. And there's really even a, a, a sort of almost pathetic passage in 
his biography that's on the Nobel website that describes how uh, events in uh, radiochemistry passed him by and how his interests were, quote, diverted, unquote, to politics and economics. Um, but during that time, he was unable to convince a broader public that atomic weapons were a foreseeable danger. And he was all similarly unable to convince fellow scientists like Polanyi that this stuff was seriously worth considering technically. And so rather than uh, taking Saadi at his word, thus the title of this slide, Saadi, you shoes too big, um, that it is our duty to spend our lives and brains thinking this thing out. I don't want to take his uh, post-World War I career as a plausible model for scientific responsibility because he, you know, he turned what was this incredibly promising and, uh, and laureled career uh, into uh, something that landed him in, in relative obscurity in, his, in Dick's Glove's words. Um, and he actually failed and discredited himself with his colleagues in the, in the process. I think these are sort of two demanding uh, criteria to impose on, on contemporary scientists. Um, but is there something else that we might look at? And I ultimately go back to those... Um, uh, those sort of uh, bullet points there in the middle uh, as what Saadi did in the early years of his career as potential models for scientific responsibility. Um, the paper then goes on to discuss some more contemporary uh, philosophy of science around uh, uh, around scientific responsibility and this picture here vastly different uh, as you can uh, do as you can understand through visual inspection, uh, but also vastly different intellectually is Heather Douglas, a philosopher of science at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. And um, basically uh, what Heather does in a 2003 paper in a, a very recent book just came out this summer, Science Policy and the Value of Free Ideal, Heather takes on the, uh, not the sliver, but a, a large bulk of the scientific community that Michael Polanyi represented in the freedom of science movement and its intellectual heirs that basically said that scientists, uh, local or, or, um, or role responsibilities as scientists supplanted their more general responsibilities as people and as citizens. That the pursuit of knowledge was so important, was so demanding uh, that they didn't have to pay attention to some of the broader responsibilities and consequences of their work in the, war in the world. And uh, basically I think in this 2003 paper that Heather wrote in the book, she uh, quite uh, convincingly uh, put this, uh, um, this belief of Polanyi and the freedom of science movement to, to rest, but she ends up doing that through creating something of a dilemma of her own. Um, that scientists need to carry this general responsibility by themselves and need to lead it because um, unlike lawyers, for example, who have relief from general responsibility, say, to report crimes, um, lawyers have the opportunity to tap a very well-established social structure that is about investigating the origins of crimes and when they have a potential conflict about revealing the criminal behavior of their client uh, or serving their client, they're allowed to serve their client because there are other people handling the general criminal behavior business. So there's no similar such structure that could be brought to bear to relieve scientists of their general responsibilities and if there were such a structure it would intrude too much into the autonomy of science both for scientists ability to do their work, but also for the broader society to get out of science what we want out of science. So therefore, she concludes, because of this dilemma, scientists have to take on these responsibilities. Now, I want to try to offer you a, a resolution of sorts to Douglas's dilemma. Um, and here on top uh, in the photograph, you see Detlef Bronck, uh, who at various times was uh, chair of the National Science Board in the United States, was president of the National Academy of Sciences, and I, th I think was uh, also later president of the Rockefeller Foundation or something like that. Um, and below him is John R. Steelman, who is the less famous counterpart in founding documents of contemporary American science policy to Vannevar Bush. And John Steelman 
Uh, unlike Bush, was a social scientist, and in 1947, he wrote a report called Science and Public Policy for the Truman administration that articulated a much more progressive and much more responsible vision of uh, science and, and its governance in the United States than Bush's Science, the Endless Frontier. And in the preface to that report, Steelman writes these words, competent social scientists should work hand in hand with natural scientists so that problems may be resolved, solved as they arise and so that many of them may not arise in the first instance. Um, and the best as I've been able to find out, Steelman attributes this to a National Academies report in the 1930s, although in a 1975 paper in Science, Detlev Bronk uh, claims to have spoken these words in congressional testimony in 1945 uh, or 46 defending Vannevar Bush's proposal for a National Science Foundation and for some bizarre reason uh, arguing for the inclusion of social science in that when everyone else from uh, Detlev Bronk's perspective including Vannevar Bush were not interested in the role of social sciences at that time. So there's a little piece of scholarship that needs to be done here finding out uh, where those words actually came from. Um, You've seen some of those people before. The person in the upper right with the bird on his head uh, is my friend and colleague, Dan Sarowitz. And in 2002, Dan and I um, wrote uh, an article called Real-Time Technology Assessment, which uh, was in part inspired by this kind of vision that uh, Bronk or Steelman or the 1930s National Academy of Sciences inspired about close collaborations between social scientists and natural scientists and engineers. And the presumptions for those kinds of collaborations that would work in the way described here, that problems may be solved as they arise, and so that many of them may not arise in the first instance, presumes a couple of perspectives. First, that it's worthwhile talking about outcomes that are still open and cannot be compelled by what is completely and concretely known. So this is a statement that Sadi here would, uh, uh, would agree with, but that Polanyi would not. Um, second, we cannot know for sure what scenario will actually emerge from our work. Uh, that's an area of consensus between both Saudi and Polanyi. Um, but then that there are at least some actions we can take in the present that will help us achieve better rather than worse outcomes for science in, his social, in its social context. Again, this is something that uh, Saudi would believe and Polanyi would uh, fight almost perhaps to the death. And what the Center for Nanotechnology and Society is in part about is exploring this concept that we call anticipatory governance that attempts to, uh, to implement a vision based on, uh, based on these several presumptions of collaboration. Um, and you know, part of the, the roots of anticipatory governance in the title, uh, in the inaccurate title that we have, is what I've just done in uh, describing this kind of uh, deep history of these concepts. Um, but second, there is a, a genealogy to the term itself. Uh, it first appears in the literature uh, in an obscure Canadian master's thesis in 1974 um, and then finds no other outlet in the literature that I can find until about 2001 where it pops up. But it's pretty clear that something's going on in the early 2000s and some of that is derived from a new take on the phrase uh, anticipatory democracy that the futurist and sociologist uh, Toffler uh, began discussing in his book uh, Future Shock in 1970-1971. Uh, um, what we've done at CNSASU is take an anticipatory governance and uh, incorporated it as the strategic vision for the center and we've described it as composed of a set of capacities in foresight, which is the, the major uh, theme of, of this talk, but also activities in public engagement and in integration of scientists and social scientists, uh, which is the, the sub, sort of sub-theme of this talk. Um, and I don't have a lot of time to march through the particular kinds of programs that CNSASU has embarked on in these areas of foresight and engagement and integration. Uh, we had a pre-conference workshop that about uh, 30 people attended that described a lot of these, a lot of these activities uh, in detail. Uh, and for those of you who are interested, you can uh, visit the CNS website and learn a little bit more about these things. We have all the presentations as well as background literature 
uh, available on CD. And if you're interested, please contact me. Uh, and we can send you the CD uh, from the presentation. The uh, presentations were also videotaped, and eventually we'll be producing something from that as well. But suffice it to say that, um, that what we're doing at uh, CNSASU is an attempt to build capacity in each of these areas of foresight, engagement, and integration. Uh, and each of these things involves close collaboration between natural scientists and engineers. Um, and we have lots of you know, models and data and, and scenarios and things like that to share um, with people who might be interested. Now, turning back to Saudi for a moment, um, in drawing toward my conclusion, um, like I said, Saudi's career after World War I I don't think is something that uh, we need to ask people to emulate because it was ultimately a public failure and, and in some sense self-destructive. Um, but he does make some, uh, some interesting comments about the relationship between the public and scientists that I'll, I'll leave it for you uh, to read up here. This is in the foreword to a 1935 volume uh, called The Frustration of Science that more or less embodied the thinking uh, at the time of a group that became known as the Scientific Humanists that included uh, people like J.D. Bernal, um, to whom the uh, freedom of science movement led by Marco Polanyi was reacting when uh, the Scientific Humanists sort of challenged uh, scientific autonomy. And I, I, I will read the, the last bullet here. The solutions for the public to require that its universities and learned societies should no longer evade their responsibilities and speak the truth though the heavens fall. So, you know, again, in calling for the social responsibility of scientists, I'm, you know, unlike Saudi, I don't need the heavens to fall. I'd like to keep them up a little bit longer. Um, but anticipatory governance is meant to address some of these flaws, to mediate between conflicted scientists and public, to moderate scientists and public beliefs that such discussions are socially dangerous, to modulate scientists' behavior toward more general responsibility rather than their role responsibility as scientists, and to remediate the public's tendency to wait till tragedy strikes before learning to be can begin. And now, the sort of uh, post-conclusion of the paper um, going back to Polanyi, um, in one of his later essays, The Growth of Science and Society, he addresses this issue of plausibility head on. And he's confronting a strange episode in the sort of history of, of public science where, um, for those of you who are familiar with Emanuel Velikovsky, um, he proposed in, I guess it was the mid and late 1950s, a theory which uh, seemed to, in his mind, explain a number of episodes in the uh, Hebrew Bible, uh, including the raining of manna on uh, the desert where the Israelites were, uh, were in exodus from Egypt. Um, that uh, there was a rogue comet wandering through the solar system that was rich in hydrocarbons, and the comet eventually settled down into the orbit of that and became the planet Venus. And Velikovsky predicted uh, from this that when we finally got to study Venus, uh, Venus would be found to be hot and would be found to have an atmosphere rich in hydrocarbons. And contrary to, to expectations of many planetary scientists, when Mariner finally got to Venus, uh, Venus was found to be hot and have hydrocarbons in its atmosphere. And Velikovsky was wondering why the scientific community did not pay him much more attention uh, because he had um, you know, ventured this hypothesis, offered a, uh, a confirmation of it, and lo and behold, it was confirmed. And nevertheless, he was not treated seriously. And Polanyi confronted this with the concept of plausibility, um, which he said was a, a really a tacit operation in the scientific community, but it had to do with what Polanyi called exactitude or reliability, systematic importance to science, and the intrinsic interest of the subject matter. And now, going back to uh, Saadi's interest in the atomic bomb, was this work that Saadi was engaged in, was his vision not plausible under Polanyi's criteria? And there's a general sense in, in the view of historians and even some, uh, some philosophers, in fact, Heather Douglas uh, points in this direction, that it really wasn't until Hahn and Frisch and Meitner um, understand the splitting of the uranium atom that, quote, all the pieces uh, were in place. And here I want to invoke um, a metaphor that Polanyi himself uses, which is a, uh, a metaphor of putting together a jigsaw puzzle as a metaphor for what individual scientists are doing in pursuing the scientific enterprise. And all the pieces into place, I think, is too much of a burden for the concept of plausibility to bear. 
Um, that's more for possibility, eventuality, inevitability. Plausibility is a much uh, weaker concept. And in this puzzle metaphor, what I would instead offer is rather than having all the pieces are in place, or for that matter, having um, all the pieces turned over, um, what plausibility is about is having enough of the pieces turned over so that you can begin to see what the general pattern might be. Whether it might be, for example, if you have enough pieces that are orange and black, you begin to think jack-o'-lantern or you begin to think tiger. And if, in fact, you're putting together pieces of reality, is it not at that point when you can think either jack-o'-lantern or tiger that you might really want to say what would happen if it's a tiger? Thank you.